very much, Max, for kind of coming. So uh, I'd like to say a few words about Max's uh, biography for those of you who don't know him. So he's a cell biologist. He's originally from Mendoza in Argentina. Um, in 2005, he obtained his PhD in cell biology from the University of San Luis in Argentina. Um, and during his PhD, he actually discovered a novel pathway that was later on called xenophagy. In 2016, he moved to EMBL in Heidelberg, Germany, as a postdoc in Garrett Griffiths' lab, um, first as a fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and then as an EMBO fellow. fellow. And uh, his work in Heidelberg focused on the cell biology and imaging of macrophages, and uh, this is really where he started to fall in love with microscopy imaging and in particular electron microscopy. And I guess you will show us uh, beautiful pictures in, in your talk, as usual. In 2009, he started his independent research group at the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research in Braunschweig, Germany, as a head, head of the uh, junior research group Phagosome Biology. And in 2012, he moved to the UK as a program uh, leader track at the Medical Research Council, National Institute for Medical Research, which then became part of the Francis Crick Institute in 2015. And since, since 2018, he is now a senior group leader at the Francis Crick Institute. And I want to add that he obtained an ERC grant and se several other grants, uh, including recently a very prestigious grant uh, of $50 million, not, not only for him, but for a group of like 15 labs, uh, from the Welcome Leap to, to, to develop and exploit novel minimal systems and bioengineered tissues and organ on chips to study human diseases. And this was really um, a big, big milestone, I think, in, in your career, Max. Um, so Max is a world-renowned expert in cellular microbiology, in particular in the TB field. And so this is what he's going to tell us about today. And so thank you very much again, Max. I switch off my cam, but um, I'll be here if you need assistance. OK, so you can hear me, right? Yeah, everything yeah. is fine. You can, yeah, everything is fine. OK. Thanks, Olivier. That was a very kind uh, and thoroughfare um, kind of intro to to my work. But um, yeah, so thanks for the invitation. I actually would prefer to be in Toulouse today, <laughs> enjoying some of the food and the drinks. But um, hopefully next time I will present some of the work that uh, Oli mentioned on on the kind of uh, tissue bioengineering aspect that we're we're starting actually in the lab. So I gave this kind of a um, title because I wasn't sure about uh, what to talk about, but then I realized, so I actually gave a talk yesterday at Ecochon in Paris, uh, again, all virtual, um, and it was more focusing on the cell biology. And because of the background of the Institute uh, that I know very well, I think uh, I will more focus this talk instead of on the cell biology more into the um, the kind of antibiotic imaging we have been doing and some of the unpublished, actually, it has been recently accepted, some of the data that I'm going to show in my talk. So you all know that I am not going to say anything about TB and how important it is, because I think you're more or less aware of this. But I really want to mention that from the cell biology perspective, um, and I was, I'm, I'm wondering if you see my arrow here moving or not? Yes, you, everything is fine. Okay. Can, yeah. okay. So basically, bacteria here will be internalized by macrophages and then localized in a membrane-bound compartment called the early phagosome. And that compartment will interact with many other organelles in macrophages and will kind of mature in another compartment which we call the late phagosome. And this is a very important component of the innate immune response because the late phagosome will uh, contain uh, uh, pro uh, proteases, lipases, and will actually decrease the pH, and that all, is all very detrimental for the bacteria. But the bacteria actually manages to kind of break that compartment and then localize eventually in the cytosol, but also be recaptured, as I uh, as Oli mentioned, uh, by a process called xenophagy, which I'm not going to talk about this today. And you can see in the lower part here, electron micrograph representing all of the different stages in human macrophages for TB. But what I want to, the point I want to make is that in cells, and of course, mycobacterium tuberculosis is an intracellular pathogen, the bacteria actually faces different environments and different compartments, which, you know, you imagine the biophysical 
And biochemical properties of an early phagosome are very, very different from, from the one that the bacteria here in the cytosol are facing. And actually, this is very important, and we have shown this is kind of like uh, many years ago now, that the different localization of bacteria in, in human cells, and here there are examples, for example, the phagolysosome, and you can see here that the uh, host membrane is in yellow and the bacterial membrane is in green, and you can see that bacteria can be in a single membrane, multiple membranes around the bacteria, in the cytosol, and also in a phagolysosome. But this localization of the bacteria actually changes depending, in, uh, depending on the um, differentiation of the cells. For example, if you differentiate macrophages with GMCSF or MCSF, and if you activate them with interferon gamma or not. So the different proportions of the bacteria in the different compartments will change uh, depending on the activation status and the differentiation status. And that tells you that in different cells, bacteria will face actually different environments. And that brings me to the main point of a question that we started to address some years ago, and is how heterogeneous is the process of infection. And here is the example that I normally show. This is how human primary macrophages in vitro infected with TB, which is green, so it's expressing a GFP protein, uh, and in presence of propidium iodide to kind of give you an idea of the status of the of the viability of the cells. And you can, I mean, there. this is published in 2017, but basically it really shows that you can find the flavors that you want. So there are cells that are highly permissive for bacterial replication and they are necrotic. There are other cells that are infected but are not that permissive. There are different cells that are dead and highly permissive and so on and so on. So there's really every cell, every cell seems to be a different kind of compartment for the cells, either for restriction or replication. So one of the questions that we started to kind of address some years ago is how the cellular environments actually affect antibiotic efficacy. And I think this is a very fascinating question because it's, it really put intracellular bacteria away from all of the uh, extracellular bacteria where you really need to uh, um, the drugs and the antibiotics go across different membranes to reach the places where the bacteria are. And why we think this is important? The, there are two main reasons, and you're probably aware of this, is that even if we are dealing with drug susceptible MTB, the treatment will take up to six months, and it's taking longer with, diff with different drugs uh, regimens. But what is more important is that the treatment of the multi-drug resistant and extensively drug resistant TB will require a very extensive therapy that can go up to two years with uh, drugs that are, we call them second line and are normally toxic and very, very expensive. So there's really like a need to understand why the treatment takes so long and there are some hypotheses around there, but we this is the part we were trying. And the question that we had is very, very valid because in intracellular bacteria, there's quite a lot of data, and I'm showing you only uh, one or two studies that we extrapolate uh, in mostly on macrophages, where you can clearly see that the accumulation of an antibiotic does not define the intracellular activity or efficacy of the antibiotic. That means there are some antibiotics that accumulate very well in macrophages, but it doesn't mean that the antibiotic is going to work better. And the other way around, there are some antibiotics that don't accumulate very, very much in cells, but actually they work really well against TB. So we were wondering what is going on in here. And we think, of course, that is something happening within the cell. So the reason why we don't very well, we, we, we didn't know at that time very well why, you know, the antibiotics were distributed within the cells is because the technologies were not available. But let's say in the last 10 years, around 10 years, there are new technologies like uh, nanoscale secondary ion mass spectrometry, and I think some of you have, have used these technologies, and it's called uh, nanoSIMs, where you can basically do kind of mass spectrometry in 2D, in 2D like, uh, like imaging, and actually I call it ion microscopy, where you can raster samples, and here are the biological samples in our case, for example, infected cells, and then you can have pixel by pixel a mass spectrum of the compounds that are and the molecules that are associated to that particular part of the cell. There are no many of these machines around the world and they're mostly used for material sciences. 
but they provide high spatial resolution. So the minimum resolution, sorry, the maximum resolution that you can get is about 50 nanometers and represents a very highly sensitive um, um, detection system with a very high mass resolution, which means we can actually detect uh, drugs like antibiotics. And this is something we've been developing in the last six, seven years together with uh, uh, Bo Young at the University of Western Australia. And there are two people, so one former PhD student in the lab, uh, Daniel, which now is in Switzerland, and Tony, which is still in the lab and is our electron microscopy and the one that um, actually helped to develop these correlative approaches. And this is again all published, but we started to do this with pedaquiline. And as you know, pedaquiline is the first antibiotic that has been FDA approved for TB in the last 50 years. And the mechanism that pedaquiline has, and this is important for for the rest of my talk, is that inhibit the bacterial ATPase and is particularly active against intracellular bacteria. However, one of the problems of, of bedaquiline is that it's highly lipophilic. So the log P is about 7.13, which actually makes people working in the pharma running away from this because any drug that you actually aim to put in the market with this very high log P they will, they will be dismissing that drug early on during the, uh, during the pipeline and the drug discovery pipeline. But actually, this is all very interesting about the drug, but the main reason why we selected, um, we started to use this, this, this drug is because of the bromine that is here. Uh, because you really need to detect these isotopes and it's the cheapest and fastest way to do it. So we didn't use any isotopically labeled drug and we just monitor in the bromine. And here is a summary of the kind of experiments we can start to do now, where you can basically do live cell imaging of human primary macrophages infected with TB. You can stop at any time and you can add the antibiotic, we, 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 you know, we add bedaquiline in this case here, and then you can monitor replication. So you can now at the single cell level know which cells are growing and which cells are not growing. And then you can fix and then focus in the cell of interest and stain for any organelles that you want, including, for example, lipid droplets in this case. And then you can zoom in now and you can have an idea where the bacteria that was replicated in the live cell is localized, but also some of the organelles. You can also do the electron microscopy correlated and also the ion microscopy now. So you can have now the flavors of all of, the, or at least the three image, most important imaging technologies that we are using, which is fluorescence, which will give you an idea of the biological um, and localization of the organelles, the electron microscopy that will give you some information about the ultrastructure, which is important for other aspects of, of, of the intracellular lifestyle of TB, but also where the drug is localized. And here is kind of a summary bigger of where bedaquiline is localized. And you can clearly see that there is some association of the antibiotic with the bacteria but it's mostly associated to lipid droplets. And here is the quantitative analysis where you can see that uh, lipid droplets mostly accumulate bedaquiline. But what is more important here is that if you look at, at the single bacterial level within macrophages, what you can see is that some of the bacteria has very high levels of bedaquiline, where other bacteria basically have no bedaquiline at all. So that was quite an interesting finding for, at least for me. There is a lot of literature out there in terms of lipid droplets and MTB, and I don't want to go into that, but we really wanted to know what was going on in our system. So with, and this is kind of a summary of what, what we did, including a lipidomic study in MTB infected human primary macrophages. And we found that MTB induces lipid droplet formation. It's a very heterogeneous process. So it really changes as the, at the single cell level. And you can really see it here how it happens. So this is a live cell imaging which goes up to 60 or over 60 hours and you can quantify it in real time the lipid droplet formation and bacterial replication and what you can start to see here and you have an example in the movie on the right that when bacteria start to grow the lipid droplets start to be consumed. This together with other data that I'm not showing you uh, we concluded that at least in the system we are working uh, mycobacterial replication actually um, so mycobacterial and tuberculosis replicate based on lipid droplets consumption. So of course, you you know the, the next question that we had is that if the um, 
antibiotic accumulated lipid droplets and bacteria is actually consuming uh, the lipid droplets, what is the effect on the bacteria? So we did a set of experiments here where we preloaded with bedaquiline the macrophages. And what I forgot to say is that in the nanosims we can visualize the bacteria by using the phosphorus because of the phosphates of the bacteria, and we're trying to understand a bit, a bit more of these. So here is the bacteria. You see that you have the bedaquiline here. So we concluded from this experiment, and remember this was preloaded, and then we detected the pedaculin in the bacteria. So we concluded that pedaculin is actually transferred from the host to MTB. But then if you preload the pedaculin, and in addition you add an inhibitor of lipid droplet formation, which in this case is pradigastat, what you can see is that there is almost no pedaculin linked to the bacteria now, localizing to the bacteria. And I'm showing you some of the EM pictures, but here on the right, you can see uh, the ions that we detected with an ion, uh, with an anosine. So we concluded that bedaculin is actually transferred from host lipid droplets instead of being kind of segregated like other people would have thought for a drug that has very high low P. But what is more important for us, and this is just the summary of that, this part, is that if you manipulate lipid droplet content in macrophages, and this is all that at the single cell level, you can see, for example, in the control, you can add increasing concentrations of pedaculin, and there is a very good effect because pedaculin actually works really well. But now if you increase the number of lipid droplets by, for example, adding oleate, now the antibiotic works better. On the other hand, if you use uh, several inhibitors at, and also different concentration of inhibitors of lipid droplet formation, now the antibiotics actually don't work in the same way as the control. They work less efficiently. So that kind of tells you that there is a control of uh, organal control of the antibiotic uh, efficacy. So that was all very good and uh, very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of follow-up studies that we are doing in the lab. But of course, one of the questions is, is this translating in vivo? And then it comes to one part that I was very, very interested in to develop, which is by trying to develop these correlative approaches by now in more in a tissue environment. And the question is, those these cellular environments of cells that are within tissues affecting antibiotic efficacy because clearly tissue affect antibiotic efficacy but the question is like are individual cells localizing those tissues now affecting antibiotic efficacy and this is a typical example of the kind of the granuloma uh, uh, foaminess that we see with bacteria because in green you can see the lipid droplets and this was a project that was led by uh, was led by uh, Tony Ferns in the lab in collaboration with Angela, which is our animal expert, and basically uh, is the C3H mouse model of infection where you infect with MTB. In our case, we infected it with a bacteria that is expressing an intracrinsome fluorescent protein, and then we treat or not the mice with bedaculin. So the first thing what we do is we take the lungs of those mice, and you can visualize here some of the typical lesions that you can observe here in red, and also you can see very well the, the vessels. So we do micro CT and we identify the lesions. And then we focus in one of the lesions, one of the particular lesions, for example, uh, the one that is localized here. And now we section that, and here is how it looks like. And then we stain for lipid droplets. And you can see here the green areas are the areas where you have fominess um, and, and actually bacteria. So you can again zoom in one part of this lesion, and this is the tip here. And again, you can see the bolipi here is, is highly foamy here. And then there are some bacteria that you still don't see. But now if you zoom in that part that you can, uh, this square that here, now we are in here. And now you start to see more things. You can start to see that there are, oops, sorry, that there are some uh, foamy macrophages that are heavily infected and they're clearly seen by electromicroscopy as well. There are a lot of things going on here and I, re I really don't have the time to expand on all of this. But basically now what we can do is focus in this particular cell. And now we can apply our approach, which contains the nanosims with the bromine imaging, the phosphorus imaging, but then correlate with the fluorescent and the EM, which is all shown in the lower part here. So we have now the ability to really focus in single individual cells in the tissue and then identify if they are infected and what are the levels of the antibiotics that are associated to those cells. We can also raster um, kind of larger uh, areas of the tissue 
and this is a larger field and you can see now of course we can i'm not going into the details of all of these but we can also monitor other ions like sulfur nitrogen uh, and of course bromine as i said before but what is more important is that we can now quantify where the antibiotic is localized depending on the cell types that we see and here is an example for example of the levels of bedaquiline and we actually could confirm in vivo what we observe in human macrophages in vitro that actually bedaquiline accumulates in foamy macrophages which is shown here but what i think it was very very interesting in this study is that we found and you can see here actually some of the cells that are heavily labeled the in red is it's bedaquiline here and you can see that there are cells that are heavily labeled with uh, with bedaquiline and then when you zoom in there you can see that actually there are polymorphonuclear cells we think these are neutrophils but we can't say because we don't have the markers and we are following up with those studies now with uh, you know mice that are expressing fluorescent probes but we we really suspect that these are neutrophils what is important here is that we we have a very uh, a relatively high accumulation compared to the um, to the foamy macrophages as well. So as a summary, I think it's nice to show it in a it kind of in a movie. So this is what we are able to do with this new method that we have developed, which we call climate. So it's correlative light electron microscopy in tissue. You can now basically do the EM, and then you can focus in specific cell types. And this is particularly a foamy macrophage now. And now you can start to do your nanosims. So the, in the middle here, there is the, um, the foamy macrophage. But you can see on the top, there are two polymorphonuclear cells. And we can, of course, see the DNA of the bacteria and the cells. In blue, you can see the sulfur, which is staining the, the lipid droplets. And in red, you can see the bedaquiline. And now when you get rid of the SEM, you can really see the distribution of the drug in the different cell types and we are following up on this but i think this is a kind of a very powerful tool to really look at the single cell level at very high resolution where the antibiotics goes in tissues and this takes me to kind of a small summary of all of this because i think as you are all aware people is looking at how lesions and granuloma affect antibiotic efficacy and this is a pioneering work from veronique d'artois and many other people now where they show that different granulomas actually will uh, differentially, so the antibiotics will uh, work differently in different uh, granulomas. But there, there are, of course, the, um, the idea that also bacterial heterogeneity uh, affects antibiotic efficacy and is, uh, you know, the, the very simple kind of uh, uh, actively growing and non-growing bacteria will, will be differentially susceptible to the antibiotics. What I think our studies are bringing is another level or layer of complexity where you have that individual infected cells actually could eventually affect antibiotic efficacy. And the metabolic status of the cell, in this case, lipid metabolism, but it could be any other type of metabolism. And again, we are exploring these options now, will affect how specifically some antibiotics will work against intracellular bacteria. So the last part, and uh, uh, this is, has been recently accepted, is in bioarchives, but there is much more data because the reviewers were asking a couple of things during the, the reviewing process, but actually it was a very good uh, experience overall. We address another question, which is like, um, within the cells, as I mentioned at the beginning, bacteria will face different subcellular localizations. And the question is, is this different localization within the cells affecting antibiotic efficacy so that was even more specific than the two previous questions it's like if we change the environment that the bacteria is within the cells is the antibiotic now work, going to work better or worse so this is the work from and this is one of the great things that france provided to my lab which is pierre uh, many of you probably know him i think olivier has been in, the, in his phd viva um, but uh, it's a very talented postdoc that took over all of these projects with the antibiotics and got interested in pyrazinamide for many reasons, uh, mostly because we at that time we couldn't image rifampicin. We still are not able to because the idea was to start with rifampicin, but also because we had a relatively good access to a nitrogen 15 labeled pyrazinamide to do these studies. Of course, you know that. It's a first-line drug, it's very important, and every time you put pyrazinamide, 
into the um, into the uh, regimen of treatment, it reduced the the length of the treatment. So it's a very very important one. The mechanism of action was originally one, but now things are kind of expanding, and different groups are actually uh, providing different um, explanations of how uh, pyrazinamide works. But what is very, very clear is that it requires low pH. And that was something that was very, very interesting for us because as I said at the beginning, MTB in theory, it's actually uh, blocking the um, phagolysosomal fission when they're in a compartment and they are not in acidic compartments. That's in kind of the theory of all of this. But again, that's that's kind of changing right now. So we started to look at, at how the pyrazinamide works and then one, one important thing that came from all of the literature that we looked is that most of the studies on pyrazinamide are in vitro. So all of the mechanism that we know about pyrazinamide and how it works and how the effect on pH, and remember that this is a drug that is used as an example of the drug that could have been only found if you do the experiments in vivo because uh, most of the, back, uh, the medium that we use for TB culture is actually not at low pH. So if you test the pyrazinamide in vitro, it doesn't work at, at, at neutral pH or you know pH around seven. But now if you um, uh, do it at lower pH, then it works. And the way it works is that you get the prodrag here, which is diffused into the cell. And then there is an uh, um, enzyme, the PNCA here, that will convert pyrazinamide into POA. And POA then will be kind of, um, efflux from the bacteria. And remember, this is the extracellular environment here. And then it will be, if, if it really finds a uh, uh, acidic uh, compartment, which has a uh, low, uh, you know, very high uh, number of protons, then it will be protonated. And then it will get into the cell again. And then it will lose a protein, uh, a proton here. And then it will decrease the intrabacterial pH. So this is more or less how it works in, uh, in vitro. But it's not really known, if, for example, if the environment here changes, and we know that in macrophages the environment actually are continually changing, how that will impact antibiotic efficacy, and in this case, pyrazinamide efficacy. So the first thing we did was to, you know, as we did with bedaquiline, see where pyrazinamide is localized. And we found, and there is a, yeah, there is something I actually, we know now that is POA. I mean, I should change all my slides because this is something that one of the reviewers asked. So basically you have pyrazinamide and POA. And because the nitrogen that we label here, sorry, I had to explain this. So the nitrogen that we label is the nitrogen 15 that is here. We would have loved to have this nitrogen lab, but, uh, label, but it doesn't work right now for us. So if you have the POA, both the product and the POA will be, will be labeled with a, with a, so by the nanosims, we can see both and we are not able to discriminate between pyrazinamide and the POA. So the prodrug and the drug. But I, I'm not going to show you this, but we've done experiments with MBOBIS, thanks to uh, Steve Gordon that is in the audience, which actually doesn't have PNCA, and with BCG as well. And we don't see any accumulation in the bacteria. So that really shows us that most of the drug that we see with the nanosims is actually POA. And now I, I'm going to this slide here. So I mean, that's why my slides here say PCA and POA, because at that time we didn't know uh, after the reviewer asked, which I think is a very valid question. But one of the things that was very surprising to me is that if you look, so the upper part here is the cell one and the, up, the lower part here is the cell two. So if you look at in the cell one, there is quite a lot of, um, and now the label is on the nitrogen 15 and we do the ratio. I'm not gonna explain why we do that, but. Uh, basically we do the ratio uh, between nitrogen 15 and, and nitrogen 14. And you see that there is some uh, pyrazinamide or POA accumulation here. But then if you look at, at other cells, and remember these are cells that are in the same uh, dish. So they're, you know, they're neighboring cells. And what happened is that one cell has a lot of pyrazinamide and it accumulates on the bacteria, whereas the other cells don't have it all. And we are trying to understand how that works because we are, yeah, you know, in concentrations of pyrazinamide that are close to the Cmax. So it would be interesting to understand why even in a very simple culture, 
you know, to the culture system, if you had very high concentrations of pyrazinamide, one cell gets a lot of pyrazinamide, whereas the other cell doesn't have. And this is kind of shown here when you compare the population versus the single cell, and you can really see that uh, some of the cells accumulate quite a lot of the antibiotic, whereas when you look at the population, it's very, very heterogeneous. But then where, um, sorry, uh, and the other thing that was interesting here is that um, there is some bacteria that accumulates quite a lot of pyrazinamide, where others don't accumulate at all. So basically at the bacterial level, it's also very heterogeneous and we're trying to understand why some bacteria accumulate more than others. But here is when we started to do some experiments and I'm not showing you, um, you know, the previous data what we have, but we know that if you have the wild type bacteria, most of the bacteria at the time we are looking here, which is between 24 and 48 hours after infection in human primary macrophages, some of the bacteria will be localized in the cytosol. But if you infect with the mutant, which is the RD1 here, RD1 lacks the type 7 secretion system and will always be in a membrane-bound compartment. So the question we want to address with this mutant is that if we change the localization of the bacteria, will that impact the distribution of the drug? And you can clearly see here that when the bacteria, this is in blue here, when the bacteria, uh, it's in a membrane-bound compartment, so this mutant that is here, it accumulates more pyrazinamide or POA. So really kind of telling you that it's very likely that because they're in an acidic compartment now, they're able to uh, accumulate more. And this is shown in another uh, way for uh, um, percentage of bacteria. And then when you look at the density plots, you can clearly see that uh, delta RD1 accumulates more uh, pyrazinamide than the wild type. So clearly changing the localization. I mean, I'm not showing you all of the controls here for the sake of time, but there are no differences in vitro. So basically nothing happens. Though, I mean, of course, pyrazinamide has an effect, but it's all in cellular, what we call the human primary macrophages, but in vitro, we don't have differences. But then if we now kind of affect the, not only the with the genetics in the bacteria, with the mutant and the wild side, but we add an inhibitor of uh, acidification in macrophages, which is bafilomycin A1, you can see now that we completely abolish the accumulation of pyrazinamide uh, in bacteria, in, in both in wild type, but also in delta RD1, uh, the mutant that is member, uh, associated to member compartments. And you can, you can clearly see it here, and you can also see it in the density plots. So basically, you have to, we had actually at least two different ways to do this. So using genetics, we show that changing the intracellular uh, localization of bacteria, we affect the distribution of the drug. And then if you change the pH uh, of the um, intracellular compartments, you also affect the accumulation of the drug. But what is the result in bacterial um, re uh, replication or growth? And this is shown here. So basically, so when you infect with the mutant, the mutant will be localized mostly in a low pH compartment. And you see here that the delta RD1 is more susceptible to pyrazinamide than the wild type here when you increase the number of uh, the concentration of pyrazinamide here. However, if you are now bafilomycin A1, uh, which is kind of at this step, so it doesn't allow the, um, the acidification of the compartments, there is basically no effect between wild type and RD1. And overall, pyrazinamide works uh, less efficiently than in this condition here. Of course, I mean, these experiments are a bit tricky because bafilomycin doesn't completely reduce the acidification of intracellular compartments. But if you use concanamycin A, which is another drug that reduces the, um, uh, the pH of, uh, of the intracellular compartments, um, sorry, that blocks the acidification of intracellular compartments, you can see that the effect is stronger. And I'm not showing you the data, but we know that actually concanamycin A works even better than bafilomycin A. And you can see here that if you increase the concentration of pyrazinamide, now the pyrazinamide works better in delta RD1 than in the wild type. And now if you move into uh, adding uh, concanamycin A, you can see now that actually RD1 even can grow a bit and it's not really susceptible to, to the pyrazinamide when you increase the concentrations. Whereas wild type is still um, a bit susceptible. But if you compare both between the two of them, 
actually um, it works uh, less efficiently than in the control when you don't add the concatenation. But then we were, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are now, you know, able to do this correlative approach. And the question was like, OK, so is this really a correlation between the localization of bacteria in acidic compartment? Because I didn't show you that. And the uh, distribution and accumulation of pyrocinobacteria. And actually, this slide summarizes quite a lot of work because it's been quite complicated to do this. So we labeled intracellular compartments, uh, um, low pH intracellular compartments with lysotracker, which is shown in red here, and then infect with bacteria in green, and, uh, and stain for uh, the nuclear with, with API. And then we image with, um, uh, with nanoseams and correlated the full correlation. And actually, and here is the nitrogen 15, which is shown in purple. And what you can see here is that some of the bugs that are actually localized in a compartment that is not acidic, and here is the quantification between lysotracker negative, which are in green, and lysotracker positive that are in red, you can see that this basically uh, pyrocinamide or POA can accumulate in MTB that is not residing in acidic compartments. This brings uh, other questions, and we think there are other mechanisms operating here, but I think it's quite interesting. And of course, remember that this is all very dynamic, and we don't know if, for example, bacteria has been facing um, low pH environments earlier before we did the experiment or after that and so on. So we're trying now to even go further and do the correlative approach with live cells and see if there is any correlation between the uh, localization in acidic environments and uh, the accumulation of pyrocinamide. But what I think, uh, and this is just to close uh, uh, the whole thing, I mean, the, the talk, but also, you know, bring in the early data on bedaquilin. So what we did is we looked at the synergy of bedaquilin and pyrocinamide. And what we shown here is that bedaquilin actually enhances the accumulation of pyrocinamide in intracellular MTB. And here we image for both the nitrogen 15 and the bromine, and you can see that it's highly heterogeneous overall. So you can find many uh, bacteria that are single positive or double positive. But what is clear is that bedaquiline um, increases the accumulation of pyrocinamide in bacteria, in intracellular bacteria. And again, I'm not showing you all of the in vitro data, but this only happens when you have uh, bacteria in macrophages and not in vitro. Uh, and this, of course, can be inhibited with bafilomycin A. So we really think, and this is actually very nice fitting with a recent paper from uh, that we actually uh, minimally contributed to it from Ludovic Taillet at the Pasteur Institute that shows that actually bedaquiline has some host-dependent effects on bacteria. And we think that's what exactly what we are doing with the bedaquiline here because this effect that we have here of the enhanced accumulation of pyrocinamide we only see it in host cells and not in vitro. But finally, and I just want to finish with this, we can even go further now. And it's, uh, this is the part, as you, I mean, as Oli mentioned at the beginning, I'm interested in imaging, but you know, this is really, we can go even better now at very high resolution. And you can, for example, in this case, visualize both bedaquiline and pyrocinamide uh, at a very high resolution. And again, here is the DNA. You can see some accumulation of phosphorus here at the tip of the bacteria. And we are kind of interested in following on that too. But now we can start to have an idea where the antibiotics in the bacteria accumulate. And you can clearly see here that they are associated to the cell wall. I remember that these are bugs that are inside the cell. So one of the ideas is now to use these technologies to really see if there are uh, differences in the way that antibiotics accumulate in bacteria that is facing different intracellular environments. And I think that's all for now. And it's kind of like uh, one, one last piece of uh, kind of ideas that I wanted to share with you is that there are some old and new concepts that I kind of discussed today in my talk, you know, in, regarding how antibiotics are penetrating uh, host cells and then getting into the bacteria. And of course, it's the idea that eventually the host metabolism can affect how the antibiotics work, but also the interaction with certain organelles. And of course, the localization of the bacteria, either in a membrane bound compartment or in the cytosol. It can be also that some of the antibiotics are sequestered in specific organelles. And of course, there that will reduce the efficacy and so on. And this is kind of the part that we are trying to understand now how all of these kind of orchestrate 
but also, you know, regarding the synergy, which is the last part that I mentioned, how, you know, the different antibiotics are actually targeting different populations within the cell. So finally, I just want to thank uh, all of the people in the lab. I mean, I only mentioned one part of the lab, which is the one that was working on antibiotic uh, distribution and imaging and correlative approaches. And most of the work that I show at the end was from uh, Pierre that is here. Many of you know him and also with, with, uh, with Tony and uh, all of the other people works in other very exciting projects, including Chris, that many of you know, that is, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that Steve was going to be here, but I could have presented the very nice paper we have on Boba in TV very recently. I also want to thank everyone at the Crick and especially the Electromicroscopy STP. We collaborate very closely with them. HIVO uh, has been a very nice collaboration for all these many years. HIVO now got a position in the University of Hong Kong. So he's not in Australia anymore, so we plan to continue working with him on developing even more technologies that allowed us to visualize antibiotics in different systems. Um, and then all of our funders, and just in case you're interested in uh, some of the pretty images that I've shown, some of them will be in our Instagram webpage uh, for, for, from the lab. And thank you very much for the attention. I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Max. It was very, very nice. Um, guys, if you have questions, you can raise your hand. And I take uh, the, the privilege I have to, to, to ask the first question. Um, two first questions, actually. So you said that rifampicin would be difficult to image in infected cells for any reason. But would you expect that they, it would accumulate in lipid droplets like beta quilin as well because of its hydrophobicity? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there... Um... There are a lot of antibiotics that we still are not able to see, and this is because nanotubes have something that is called the matrix effect. So basically, if you put a drop of the drug in a, in a cover slip, you can see it in a nanosim. But when you put it in combination with uh, biological material, in this case, whole cells, you don't see it anymore. So we're trying to kind of go away, you know, like um, into that. Um, the prediction will be that, yeah, but maybe not that highly associated to lipid droplets. We think that other antibiotics like, um, you know, uh, linezolid, clofacimine, and all of that will eventually accumulate in lipid droplets as well. And, you know, there are actually quite a lot of studies showing that uh, the combination of these antibiotics works really well. So we think that it's maybe related to what we just found for bedaculin that applies to these other antibiotics as well. But INH, for instance, would not? No. And uh, second question is um, regarding the synergistic effect of uh, betaquilin on PZA. Oh. So you said, you said it happens only in, in cells and not in vitro. Um, I, I don't remember well the work of Ludovic, but, but did he show that betaquilin uh, uh, stimulates uh, phagosome acidification in, in macro? Yeah. Did ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I'm in that paper as well. So we're, um, yeah, so th that's what we really liked it from, you know, it really fits with the idea that Pinaculin is doing something else on host cells. And um, in our paper, we see it as well. So the Pinaculin is doing something, which, you know, it's, and we also, we didn't put it in the paper, but it also fits with, uh, because Ludo tried with mitochondria, which was kind of the obvious thing that, and it, it doesn't seem to be, in our case, it's the same. So we don't see much uh, with the mitochondria. It's something else. Okay. Very nice. Okay. We have a question first from Isabel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I give her the floor. Okay. Lisa, you can speak. Okay. Thank you. Hey, hi. Nice uh, hi. Nice to see you also. Yeah. And I, I really enjoyed both images and, and science. So thank you very much for the talk. Um, let, uh, let me ask a question about badaquilin. Uh, where is it located in macrophages when you use a lipid droplet inhibitor? Do you know that? Yeah, so um, what we see is that um, the, there is a very drastic uh, decrease in the badaquilin that we can detect. There is some, and it's very likely to be, you know, in other lipidic like okay. ER or something like this. But mm -hmm. uh, so we even did that experiment with like conventional mass spectrometry. And, you know, we just treat it or not, and then um, with oleate, and then we do uh, we did LCMS, 
And actually, the ones that are or you with inhibitors, as you said, it really reduces the bedaculin in cells, total oh. bedaculin. There's still some, and we think that that kind of low levels of bedaculin are very likely into, you know, ER. Okay. I, I have another question. Uh, when you say that uh, pyrazanamide is not present in all cells and is not present, of course, in all bacteria. Have you tried to characterize the macrophages that are, let's say, resistant to the drug entry? Are there subpopulations that are maybe polarized or maybe, uh, uh, you know, this uh, patrolling macro macrophages? Have you tried that? Yeah, we are very interested in that. Uh, you know, it's a very relatively, you know, simple question but it, it really needs more technologies to so one one thing that is important here is that it does look like um, there is a donor variability here in how the antibiotic work so if we if we produce macrophages from a donor one and we do the experiments in parallel with a donor two uh, there will be differences and I'm very interested in that you know the cells have been differentiated in the same way and uh, and they're they're running parallel and then you put the same concentration of pyrazinamide and actually it works better in one than in the other so there there are some you know like intrinsic properties of the donor you know these are cells that have been differentiated in vitro for a week so we don't expect a lot of that, but we are kind of interested very much. I, I was not only speaking about the differences between two donors. I was speaking of also about the differences that you see in a donor in which you have macrophages that are able to internalize drugs and others, same culture, same guy, that are not able. So yeah. it was a question. Do you know if the origin or the age, or whatever the, the cells, in what mode are they different? Yeah, that's, again, it's, re, it's kind of related. So we, we need to predict, which is something we can now. You know, we cannot do that. So what we are trying to do now is to do a phenotypic characterization yeah. before starting the live cell imaging, and then adding or not the antibiotic and see which phenotypic parameters are actually the ones that allowed us to predict if in this cell the antibiotic is going to work better or not. But we need to have uh, other technologies, as I said, because this is something like is life cell, long term life cell imaging at the single cell level with multiparametric imaging. Thank you very much. No, thank you. And it's nice to see you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, okay. Etienne is next. You can also ask questions in the chat, guys. Huh? So Etienne. Uh, OK. Uh, Etienne, we cannot hear you, the microphone. Hey, Max. You hear me? Hey, Very hi. Nice. Thank you. Uh, I have a question that relates a bit to the one from Isa. Um, maybe I missed it, but you you show that there is accumulation of the BDQ in the in neutrophils somehow. Um, what would be the point of putting BDQ, or what would be the the effect of BDQ on neutrophils actually? Because if I remember well, MTB does not grow that much in neutrophils. It uses them, but it does not really really grow. Yeah, yeah. You're you're speaking like an immunologist and cell biologist. But remember that we just treat the mice and we see where the drugs go. And what we found is that it actually accumulates in certain cell sites. We don't know if that has a function or, you know, if it were, it happens. So one of the hypotheses that we have now is that, because one of the ideas is like, okay, so first, and I think that is the most important and most difficult question is where the neutrophils get loaded with the antibiotic because they are recruited during the infection. And then they're heavily, you know, they're very high in, into bedaculin. And it's like, are they getting the bedaculin once they are in the tissue? Or they are getting loaded somewhere else and bringing more bedaculin into the lesion? So these are the questions we are answering now. But uh, it was kind of a finding that it was really surprising to see. We, we did also see, 
you know, kind of confirming some of the studies from Christina Stolins and Uri Shiable that actually the neutrophils are viable and infected. So we could see it in the EM as well. But what is the kind of outcome of this accumulation? We don't know. We only know that it happens. So you I think, think that that's the question. Uh, and for your gut feeling, do, do you think that there is some toxicity on neutrophils or that it will boost something or that it will process the drugs? Yeah, we have a, yeah, so we have this, this extensively because of course the neutrophils are a very particular cell type and they have all of these granules and um, we do see actually that the pedaculin and remember that they don't have lipid droplets. So the lipid droplets in neutrophils are very, very low. Some of them have, but it's nothing compared to, and we do see the pedaculin there. And it does seems to be cytosolic. So there are a lot of questions here. You know, why it accumulates there? Uh, you know, why actively one cell type is actually getting the antibiotic? I think the, 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 it's a very interesting thing. We actually, we are following up on that. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you, Etienne. Um, so before I give the floor to the other Etienne, there is a question in the chat from Christelle saying, beautiful for me macrophages in the lung of C3H mice. Did you see if some of them are multinucleated in granulomas? Um, we looked because, of course, we are interested in uh, because of the bovine project. Um, I don't think so, actually. I don't think we've seen Maybe a couple, but it's not very prominent, really. Uh, you know, we probably found some, but not many. Okay. Uh, Etienne Jolie. Okay. Hi. Uh, I, I'll put my... Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. I um, just want to make sure I understood well before I was asking my question. From what you presented, I... TB is not really my field or not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. if I understand well, TB induces lipid droplets in cells and it also induces transport of bedaquiline to those lipid droplets. Is, is that right? Did I get that right? No, the, um, yeah, the first part, yes. But the, um, the accumulation of, um, of bedaquiline lipid droplets does not have anything to do with TB. So basically, the drugs will go to the pre-existing lipid droplets. Some of them are induced by TB, but mm -hmm. that, that TB regulates the bedaculin target to the lipid droplets. Okay, it's a, so like a very uh, passive effect. You know, it's not like a, an active. Okay, so I that was my qu my question. Mm -hmm. I, I had the impression that you from the way you presented or uh, my misunderstanding I had understood that TB induced the transport to lipid droplets but so what, TB doesn't induce anything on the daquilin bar for the induction of lipid droplets so. yeah so the, it's kind of again the you know um, let's forget about the drugs and antibiotics so in the process of infection TB induces lipid droplet formation this foaming is and so on and now we have a drug that when you treat that, the drug accumulates there. Yeah, it's just a lipophilic thing, but if you put any, exactly. any other lipid, uh, you would find it in lipid droplets. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. But the kind of the difference here is that in general, you would expect that a drug that accumulates in lipid droplets be less efficient because it's less available. For it accumulating, in, you know, that's why in the, you know, this log P value makes the drugs not compatible with, uh, you know, drugs in the clinic because they're accumulated in tissues at the expense of the target. But in this case, it's the other way around, and it's because the TB normally uses these lipid droplets. Now, they, there is more drug getting into the target. So, hard. the idea of not having fatty drugs is not necessarily... Uh written engraved exactly. in stone exactly. don't, don't walk away from fatty drugs exactly. well that suits me very well <laughs> thank yeah, you exactly now you're welcome yeah thank you etienne okay no more questions guy no so, uh, Edia.
say it's great talk. Thank you. This differential distribution and accumulation of drugs between cells and donors. Is this a bad news for efficacy of the treatment? Um, I, I'm not, I, I think it's just news, but I, it also kind of, um, you know, kind of explain why you need these uh, multiple antibiotic treatment for such a long period of time. Because there are so, you know, the complexity of all of this is much higher than we thought. And um, I mean, one of the ideas that we want now is that to really see if we can predict certain combinations of antibiotics that goes into, you know, that apply to more donors, let's say a more general effect. That would be the one. Maybe a very quick last question. Well, no, there is another one, but one for me. Was it known, this synergistic effect of beta and PZA in vivo, in mice or in patients? Yeah, yeah. In fact, one surprising thing when you start to read the literature is that piracinamide alone in mice doesn't work that well. Well, in, in B6 mice. Yes, it doesn't work very well. No, and even in T3H, the, really? you know, the effect alone is not that striking. It works really well when you put another antibiotic. And I think with Bedaculin, yeah, it's this paper from uh, Leonard and Leonard that they show that actually um, there is a good synergy between Bedaculin and Pyrocinamide. Okay. A last question from Manjari. Great talk. Can we reduce the formation of foamy macrophages by preloading the Bedaculin in macrophages or simultaneously adding along with bacteria? Yeah. So I think I got that um, question. Yeah. So we preloaded with bedaculin just to show that there is a transfer from the macrophage into the bacteria but we have done i mean it's all in the kind of supplementary uh, material there but we done all of the uh, kind of combinations you know before or after um during the question uh, is that, that does it reduce the formation of foamy macrophages if you preload with bedaculin does it reduce the lipid droplets content if i understood oh you mean from the beginning um no no. Okay. So if there is no more question, I think we can stop here and thank you again uh, no, very much.